six times in just 10 days. That's how often our sun fired X-class solar flares at Earth this November, all from the same angry region on the solar surface. The strongest, an X 5.1 monster, became the most powerful solar eruption we've witnessed in over a year. But here's what makes this different from every other solar storm you've heard about. It's not the power that concerns scientists most. To understand why this series of eruptions matters, we need to go back to a moment many of you will remember. March 13, 1989. The province of Quebec woke to darkness. Six million people without power for nine hours because a geomagnetic storm had overwhelmed transformers across the grid. That event became our benchmark, the standard by which we measured solar danger. But here's what we didn't fully grasp back then. We were living in a fundamentally different world. In 1989, we had approximately 2,000 satellites in orbit. Today, that number exceeds 13,000. The infrastructure we've built above our heads has transformed the threat equation entirely, and this November's solar activity has given us our first real glimpse of what that means. Active Region 4274 appeared on the sun's surface in early November, and almost immediately, it began to behave unusually. Between November 9th and 14th, this single sunspot cluster unleashed six X-class flares, five of them in rapid succession. The crescendo came on November 11th at 5 a.m. Eastern Time, when the region produced an X5.1 eruption, nearly five times more powerful than the flares that preceded it. NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory captured the moment in exquisite detail, a magnetic field line snapping like an overstretched rubber band, releasing energy equivalent to a billion atomic bombs in a matter of minutes. The electromagnetic pulse reached Earth eight minutes later, exactly as physics predicted. Radio communications across Europe and Africa simply ceased. High-frequency signals that had been carrying information across continents met a wall of ionized particles in Earth's upper atmosphere and scattered into noise. But the real story was still traveling toward us at a million miles per hour. Three coronal mass ejections, vast bubbles of magnetized plasma, each carrying billions of tons of solar material, had been launched toward Earth. They arrived in waves. The first two struck on November 12th, merging with material already in the solar wind to create what scientists call a cannibal CME, where faster material overtakes and consumes slower ejecta ahead of it. Then the third wave hit, the one driven by that X5.1 flare. Earth's magnetic field responded violently. The storm reached G4 severe levels, only one step below the maximum classification. In the Shetland Islands, British geologists recorded something unprecedented, a geoelectric field of 3.5 volts per kilometer, the largest measurement since their monitoring began in 2012. To put that in perspective, that's enough electrical potential in the ground itself to overwhelm transformer systems. It's the signature of a magnetic field being twisted and compressed beyond normal limits. But here's where the story takes a crucial turn and why scientists at NJIT and NASA have been studying the data so intensively. The pattern of eruptions from Region 4274 revealed something we'd only theorized about before. Each successive flare appeared to be priming the magnetic environment between Earth and Sun, making the space through which the next eruption would travel more conducive to particle acceleration. By the time the X5.1 flare launched its coronal mass ejection, the path had been prepared. The result was a storm that hit harder than its raw numbers suggested it should. Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin felt this firsthand. Their new Glenn rocket stood ready to launch NASA's Escapade Mars mission on November 12th. But the solar particle storm made launch impossible, not because of any danger to the rocket itself, but because the radiation environment would have damaged the spacecraft's sensitive electronics during the critical hours after deployment. For the first time in the commercial space era, solar weather forced a major launch delay. The decision was vindicated when measurements showed particle flux levels not seen since 2005. We're now learning that our predictive models missed something fundamental. When NASA's missions from Stereo to SOHO tracked these storms, they revealed that the interaction between multiple coronal mass ejections creates feedback loops we hadn't fully accounted for. The magnetic fields carried by each CME don't just add together, they can amplify each other through resonance effects. This is why the November storms produced auroras as far south as Florida and Mexico, latitudes that typically require much stronger direct measurements to see such displays. As we record this in late November, Region 4274 has rotated away from Earth-facing position, but the data it generated will occupy researchers for months. We're 11 years into this solar cycle, approaching what should be the declining phase of solar maximum, yet our star has delivered one of its most intense sequences of activity. The implications extend beyond scientific curiosity. Every satellite constellation operator, every power grid manager, every airline that routes flights over polar regions now has concrete evidence of how quickly space weather can escalate. 
The pattern we witnessed, six major flares in 10 days from a single active region, represents a scenario our infrastructure planning has never seriously contemplated. We built our orbital architecture during relatively quiet solar conditions, and we're only now stress testing it under the full fury of an active sun. 36 years after Quebec went dark, we've learned that the question isn't whether a storm of that magnitude will happen again, it's whether we've made ourselves more vulnerable in the decades since, by weaving our civilization more tightly into the fabric of space itself. And this November November, for six days, the sun showed us exactly how much we still have to learn about the star we orbit.